Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. The conflict in Ukraine has become a focal point in the international arena with the United States and NATO countries actively supporting Ukraine. This support has stirred geopolitical tensions and raised questions about the broader implications of global politics. This support provided by the United States and NATO to Ukraine has taken various forms, including economic aid, military assistance, and political backing. However, the motivations for this support are complex. While the West and others involved in the proxy war see their support for Ukraine as a way to promote democracy, protect Ukraine's territorial integrity, the Russian Federation, on the other hand, views them as a foreign interference and a strategic encroachment on its sphere of influence. And this is where, of course, the bond of contention settles. Also, a strong resistance has emerged even in the United States of America, urging the USA and NATO to end this uh, proxy war in Ukraine, blaming them for the escalation of the crisis and for derailing the, p the peace process that could end the bilateral disagreement between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. According to some pundits, it is important, therefore, to contemplate on the uh, cost of uh, funding Ukraine and also equally important to keep in mind the cost of not funding Ukraine. So the program views on the continent this day aims to assess the geopolitical implications of a U.S. NATO support for Ukraine, examining the potential consequences for regional stability, European security, and the relationship between Western powers and the Russian uh, Federation. Stay with us. This is Views and the Continent. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this day, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, on the first program for the week views on the continent. And today we are looking at uh, the uh, geopolitical implications uh, of uh, the uh, US and NATO support for uh, Ukraine, of course. Uh, we are asking uh, this question, if uh, the support uh, from the US and uh, other NATO uh, countries is actually ex uh, uh, actually helping out to quell the crisis or is it foiling the crisis and impeding the peace, uh, the peace process? Uh, that is what we are looking at uh, today in the, the program views and the continent. We want to get your own understanding of where the crisis in Ukraine is uh, regarding uh, the uh, support, uh, uh, be it in military form, economic, and of course uh, financial uh, support from the United States and uh, of course all the NATO countries coming at a time where we see a strong resistance even from uh, uh, people around the United States calling for the uh, government to uh, actually stop uh, foiling the, uh, the proxy war in uh, Ukraine, uh, blaming this support for derailing uh, a peaceful and practical solution to the bilateral uh, disagreement between uh, uh, the Ukraine and the Russian Federation. You are most uh, welcome just to remind you that uh, this is informative as well as interactive program put together. Uh, for one hour, we're going to be assessing, analyzing uh, these uh, very important uh, topic, uh, assessing the geopolitical implications of uh, the uh, uh, US and NATO support for Ukraine, and uh, I will be glad to introduce to you this ex team uh, panel that will give us, uh, uh, of course, highlights or insight on uh, the development in Ukraine and, of course, looking at uh, the uh, uh, ramifications of uh, the support. Let me, uh, let me take you now to the United States of America, precisely uh, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. We are meeting Steve Gill, who is a political commentator and is joining us this day to give 
highlight on this very important topic. Hello to you, Steve. It's a pleasure having you on Afric Media Television for the first time. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's always a pleasure having you to share your own perspective uh, on what is happening, especially as uh, the war between or the crisis between uh, Russia and Ukraine are a concern. And now let's go to Russia. We're meeting uh, Yulia Berg, joining in her capacity as a political scientist. It's a pleasure having you this day, dear Yulia. Hello, it's always a pleasure to be here and thank you for raising the most topical issues. I should be saying thank you for honoring uh, this uh, invitation as we continue to understand and to throw more light on the development uh, in uh, the uh, Ukraine. And today we are focused is on uh, the uh, call uh, by some people and even some pundits have been very critical about uh, the role of uh, the US and other NATO countries uh, regarding uh, their position in the crisis uh, uh, between uh, the uh, Russian Federation and of course, uh, Ukraine. Uh, let's uh, dive straight away uh, to understanding uh, the uh, implications of this, especially geopolitical in, uh, implications. I start off with you, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, according to some critics, U uh, Ukraine's counter uh, offensive depends solely on uh, the uh, US and uh, NATO uh, support, uh, that is, the arms support for Kyiv, uh, thus derailing uh, peace process and exacerbating the crisis. So what is your perspective? Do you share the same uh, uh, view as far as this premise is concerned? Well, um, Ukrainian counteroffensive, uh, so-called, that's uh, the topic that was being discussed starting from spring. And mostly uh, it was something used uh, to manipulate the European Union, the US, and to justify it to the public that more and more aid would be provided, right? So it was being announced starting from uh, spring this year, and then it was um, kind of scheduled for the summer. Uh, nothing ever really happened in terms of a full-scale counteroffensive. And then it was, uh, you know, in rhetorics in the public space, uh, it was moved to the fall, but then nothing followed, but random, uh, you know, attacks uh, trying to check uh, the air defense, trying to check the defense and find the weak spots uh, on the uh, Russian positions. So um, I would say that mostly it was something existing uh, as an egregor of a kind just only in the public space to be able to ask for more and more uh, money, for more and more ammunition coming in. Uh, and I think now they will be talking about, you know, uh, fall as not the best season for a counteroffensive. They will be talking about uh, filling it for winter when the snow falls and when the ground freezes and everything else. And, uh, you know, last forever, because the, uh, the purpose of this one is just to uh, is just to be getting more and more uh, funds and to be justifying it in front of the uh, public, because Ukraine at the moment is quite a failed state. Uh, it cannot exist without foreign aid. It cannot exist without foreign financial aid, military aid and to a certain extent, uh, um, you know, advisors. So that's that's the uh, tragical state of affairs in uh, in modern Ukraine about uh, the state of affairs in uh, modern uh, Ukraine. Uh, let me uh, uh, continue with you, uh, Mr. Steve uh, Gill. And uh, now we are talking about this aid that uh, Ukraine is actually uh, receiving from the US and uh, other NATO uh, countries. Uh, uh, the question like, uh, the question I want to direct to you is, what are the stakes and of course, a long-term geopolitical ramification of uh, the support help uh, rendered uh, to the government of Ukraine uh, by the United States and other NATO nations. Steve. You know, it's interesting. You're starting to see a, a, a backing of uh, backing off of uh, financial support for Ukraine. Uh, we just had elections in Slovakia where the, the party that won the majority of votes has been adamant saying they will not fund any more dollars to, to Ukraine. Uh, Hungary is taking the same position. You now have a majority 
of members of the Republican uh, controlled House of Representatives in the U.S. that want to stop uh, financial aid to Ukraine. So, so the blank check uh, moving forward seems to be drying up, although the Biden administration in the U.S. is adamant about continuing to fund uh, Ukraine, whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Uh, the uh, amount of armament that's been sent there cannot really be uh, 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 transparent in terms of where the money's gone, where it's been spent. And again, advocates of uh, Ukraine in the U.S. and in NATO are fighting against any kind of accountability or accounting of where funds have gone. Uh, there is rampant corruption in Ukraine. Uh, the uh, Ukrainians uh, recently dismissed their defense minister and six deputy defense ministers for corruption. Uh, earlier this year, they had uh, uh, dismissed 15 or 20 other ministers for corruption. And I think uh, Americans and those in, uh, in Western Europe are starting to question, why are we funding so much money to such a corrupt regime under the guise that this is about democracy? I mean, this is the kind of democracy where President Zelensky has canceled their elections, has canceled opposition parties, has canceled independent media, and has actually attacked uh, religious liberty by attacking the Russian Orthodox Church. That's not the kind of democracy that I think most Americans or most Western Europeans would embrace. Uh, and frankly, what, what they say about Putin and Russia is what they are demonstrating in Ukraine. So I think that's drying up the, the idea of financial support for a corrupt regime that seems to be making no progress. Uh, okay, let me stay with you. Uh, looking at uh, this support and, of course, uh, the crisis uh, uh, between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, and how does uh, this <coughs> U.S. Uh, NATO support for uh, Ukraine impact uh, the uh, the balance of power in uh, the the region, particularly uh, the relationship uh, uh, to Russia's uh, uh, in relation? I beg your pardon to Russia's influence. You know, I think it's unfortunate that, that one of the byproducts of this has been to force Russia and China closer together. I mean, one of the biggest adversaries for the U.S. Uh, militarily, um, economically, in terms of world power, is China. And, and their threats to Taiwan are, are something that should be taken very, very seriously in, in terms of U.S. foreign policy and, and global policy. And yet the, uh, the approach to this Ukraine-Russia conflict has, has pushed Russia and China closer together, made uh, Russia, the biggest uh, economic uh, ally of China at this point, uh, you know, you're seeing Chinese dollars flow endlessly into Russia, buying oil, construction, automobiles that are now being sold in uh, in Russia that uh, previously were American-made automobiles. So, so the balance is shifting economically, and I think uh, in terms of power and and military threat as well. And it's unfortunate, as as you mentioned at the very beginning, Clarice, this this has been going on over 18 months. And yet there are no peace talks. There's no effort to find a resolution. You will not find a resolution when there's no conversation, when there's no attempt to find what can we do to end the war? What can we do to end the conflict, end the carnage? There aren't even discussions underway and there's no serious attempt to do so. Actually, there where the bone of contention lies, like we said uh, in the preamble, uh, looking at the reasons advocated by these uh, countries uh, supporting uh, Ukraine, and of course the re uh, reasons advocated by the uh, Russian Federation for involvement also in uh, this uh, military, uh, special military operation. Now the question is, uh, is that this one, I'm directing it to you, uh, dear Yulia. Let's look at uh, the economic and energy aspect of, of the uh, Ukraine uh, crisis. How do the U.S. and uh, NATO policies impact regional stability and also the energy security? as far as uh, their involvement in the crisis is concerned. <clears throat> well, uh, when you analyze uh, things like that, uh, you should always look at who benefits from, uh, you know, this conflict. And so the one of the main beneficiaries for sure is the uh, military industrial complex, right? That keeps supplying uh, weapons and munition that keeps receiving new orders and, uh, you know, new making new deals. Because uh, this conflict and the fact that the European uh, Union is involved and, you know, the, the country based, uh, the country based, um, let's say, armies uh, are involved. And I'm saying country based uh, because most of those uh, 
military bases in Europe, not even European, right? Like Germany, for instance, uh, uh, has lost its military potential. And now what we see happening at the uh, um, conflict zone is that a lot of, uh, you know, weapons and a lot of equipment that comes in, including the tanks and including some other things, they're just not effective under those, uh, you know, conditions. And uh, one of the reasons for that is uh, also the fact that uh, most of that military equipment is uh, highly um, uh, let's say it's um, technologically advanced, but it implies an active mm. use of electronic systems and accumulators and everything else that do not always demonstrate to be effective in, in those uh, that um, that are, uh, you know, real in Ukraine, especially in winter. So when we talk, when we're talking about low temperatures, when we're talking about situations when they cannot be repaired on time and everything else. So most of it uh, is not even, uh, you know, used properly uh, over there. And what this means, this means that there is always, uh, you know, the need for more and more of, uh, you know, weapons and munition and military equipment. Also, this happened to be a major revision for uh, the state of affairs in terms of the uh, military complex in the European Union. And it turned out that a lot of the, uh, you know, vehicles and a lot of the equipment that was being stored is just out of order. So it was there on paper, but when you take it to the uh, to the war theater, uh, it happens to be just, uh, you know, a bunch of metal, no more than that. I'm not talking about everything, you know, a lot of it happened to be, you know, exactly that. So uh, that was a major revision. And that was, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, one of the uh, ways how uh, the European military complex could be taken under even more uh, strict control. And on the other hand, uh, this is how, uh, again, new deals uh, could be made in terms of future supply. So sorry for getting a bit into details of this one, but uh, it's a very important issue because uh, this has to do with the its sovereignty and this has to do with the uh, ability to hypothetically protect oneself from you know, military threats. So we're still at, at a stage of development as a you know, humanity that uh, has not found effective methods of conflict resolution without, uh, you know, military activities. Hopefully one day we will get there, but uh, it's not there yet. And when we talk about the economic implications or impact uh, over regional economy, well, Russia is not doing as bad as it was expected to be doing. And, uh, you know, again, um, business is just like water so if there is a, an opportunity to flow somewhere it does so when uh, the european and american brands and companies have left uh, the country some of them have not even really left uh, some of them just uh, try to uh, uh, displace uh, the uh, management and to you know um, they were trying to sit on two tiers at a time, which is that they were trying to match the requirements issued by their home countries. And at the same time, they were trying to keep the business in Russia. But even the ones who left, they were um, replaced by Asian companies. They were replaced by, you know, uh, midwife uh, um, let's say, companies that were uh, basically making sure that the same goods are reaching Russia, but via, you know, different uh, uh, middlemen. So uh, that is all out there and that is all clear uh, because, you know, business is business and politics is politics and business and economy in general uh, lays foundations for, you know, many other things and you cannot just uh, cancel it out. Uh, even if you wish to do so. So I think the Russian economy has proven to be doing better uh, than it was expected to be doing. And we see that, uh, well, recently there were no, um, you know, new uh, sanction uh, packages, um, probably because the opportunities uh, of, you know, sanctioning Russia are about to be over. There's still probably a way to go, but, you know, all of the main things that could have been done were already done. And we see that despite of the fact that Russia is uh, an enemy to many countries, the business is still out there, not to mention the fact that the gas still keeps going through Ukraine in terms of transit, and that is still happening. Uh, 
let me stay with you, uh, listening critically uh, to uh, the analysis uh, you've just uh, made. Uh, I am tempted to ask uh, this question to you, uh, dear Yulia. Now, looking at this, uh, uh, you know, some people, when we talk of the uh, U.S. and uh, other NATO nations proxy war in Ukraine, there are also some people who feel like it is not feasible. So with everything uh, that is happening, and of course the sale of arms and, and others uh, that uh, uh, maybe uh, these companies are benefiting from the, Ukraine, uh, uh, from the war in Ukraine, can you say uh, that uh, this is why uh, they have intentionally uh, continued supplying this uh, assistance to, to Ukraine in all forms to be able uh, to be able to actually delay the peace uh, talks? You know, uh, earlier on, uh, Mr. Steve uh, underlined that it is pathetic that there are no uh, uh, constructive peace talks so far to be able to, to curtail or to put an end uh, to the disagreement or bilateral disagreement uh, between the Russian Federation and, uh, the, uh, 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 and the Ukraine? Well, uh, last year in April, mm -hmm. there were oh. peace talks taking place and at a certain point they reached uh, very visible results. And it was in Istanbul where, you know, certain moves were made by both sides of the conflict, which is Russia and Ukraine, in order to come up with a solution. Um, yet what happened next, and I think Steve could also elaborate on it uh, even more, what happened next uh, was a visit of Boris Johnson to Kiev. And right after those talks and consultations, it wasn't just that Ukraine withdrew from the peace talks, but moreover, Zelensky signed a decree, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the form of a decree, saying that it was no more legal to host any uh, or take part in any peace talks with Russia. Moreover, what else happened in Ukraine in the period of time was that one of the active participants of the Ukrainian negotiation group was found dead, right? So that also poses some questions, and I mean, Russia can be blamed as much, uh, you know, as it could be. Um, but uh, it's very strange when you see such a sequence of, uh, you know, facts unfolding. So at the moment, even if Zelensky wanted to, it would have been illegal for him to take part in any kind of uh, a negotiation. And I think that was, uh, you know, maybe not even his decision, but uh, it was one of the terms and conditions laid out in front of him by, uh, you know, his, uh, call them whatever, curators because he does not seem to be an independent political figure. Of course, of course he uh, enjoys and exercises freedom to a certain extent, and sometimes I, <clears throat> I assume from the uh, reaction in the publics and open sources that sometimes it surprises even the, um, the ones like coordinating him. But uh, even if we look at the, uh, you know, political arena, starting from, you know, the beginning of the uh, escalation, some of the people that were playing a very active role in the happenings in Ukraine are not holding their positions anymore, as if, uh, you know, it was also a part of some kind of a deal, right? So... Um, when you analyze all those all those uh, all those facts, and those are just the uh, the surface ones, the ones available in the public space, and we never know what's actually happening somewhere behind the scenes, right? Uh, it already poses questions. So Ukraine was ready to negotiate uh, a peace deal. Uh, and, uh, you know, Russia, uh, neither last year nor right now, it's not using all of its uh, military and economic, uh, you know, potential uh, against uh, the ones that are called not even enemies in, in uh, you know, our legal and public um, field, but they're called um, officially non-friendly countries, right? So the gas still flows out there. Um, and of course, it's mutually beneficial for both parties. Uh, the um, Ukrainian infrastructure and civilian objects are not being targeted, as it happens in Donbass, where you know any school, any open market, anything could be targeted, and that's what's been happening since 2014 with a lot of civilian victims, right? So Russia is not even rolling out all of it. Um, 
all of its potential in terms of, you know, escalating further. And I'm not even talking about nuclear weapons. And I think this uh, very patient position of Russia is exactly because of that. Because when you're sitting on all of your, like, nuclear potential and you know that you can destroy the entire planet several times, uh, you know, you're, you're quite cool with, uh, you know, just waiting a little bit till... Uh, Till, as they say in China, you know, there is the saying that if you sit by the water and watch the river flow for long enough, you will see the corpse of your enemy just uh, floating by. <laughs> so I think that's the uh, that's the thing. And when uh, President Putin says that we haven't even started yet, I think that's what he means. If you are just tuning in now, you're welcome to Africa Media, and this is Views on uh, the uh, Continent. Today, we are analyzing uh, the uh, geopolitical implications of uh, U.S. and NATO support for uh, Ukraine. In uh, the uh, same perspective, um, Steve Gill, uh, looking at the analysis uh, brought forward by you so far and Yulia, we see that uh, the situation uh, in uh, the Ukraine is actually uh, complex uh, and, of course, a lot of that is actually hidden behind the scene. So now let's answer the question, looking at the political implications of, of this support. In your perspective, what are the geopolitical implications of the support uh, by U.S. and NATO countries to Ukraine, which are not very feasible uh, to uh, the uh, uh, public? First of all, let me follow up on, on Yulia's comment about the Russia's patience in this conflict. Uh, she's exactly right. The, the, the Russian military has not been as aggressive as as they could be and, and could be prosecuting this, uh, uh, this conflict much more aggressively. In fact, President Putin is getting some pushback in Russia because some in Russia, he should be much more aggressive. But I think he is wisely playing the long game of recognizing that there will be an after this conflict. And after this conflict, uh, there will be a lot of sorting out of who did what and, and who did, did more wrong than the other. And, and I think he's looking at the long game of how do you get back into the mainstream of nations after this is over. And, and uh, Yuli and I have actually talked before that there's not a lot of con, uh, conversation right now about the after uh, on, on either side of this conflict or, or around the world. And, and people need to start thinking about what comes next, because even U.S. military experts that are commenting on U.S. media are recognizing that the, that the um, last year offensive, the spring offensive, the summer offensive, now ending the fall offensive, has not worked, that uh, the military equipment that's been provided to Ukraine has mostly been destroyed. I think the U.S. is sending about 16 more tanks. That's not going to shift the, uh, the battlefield uh, significantly. So I think uh, the, the paid enough attention to the, to the patience and to Russia holding back military force. And again, as Yulia mentioned, we're not talking about nuclear. They, they have not carpet bombed Ukraine or civilian areas or, or done launches of attacks on Kyiv because they've, they've wanted to hold back and prevent this thing from escalating more than it already has. So I think uh, some credit has to be given to President Putin and his patience, which again has caused some backlash in Russia. On the economic side, again, I'd, I'd agree with Yulia that this is bigger than, than just uh, uh, what we're seeing in, in terms of the short-term allocation of resources, both military and, and economic aid to Ukraine. I was talking with one of my friends who's uh, in the U.S. Senate uh, the other day and pointed out that this is the first time in history that I can recall that the U.S. has actually supported both sides in a conflict. On one hand, we're providing billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine, both militarily and, and with economic aid. We're paying their bureaucrats. We're paying for the operation of their government. Uh, on the other hand, the sanctions have raised the price of oil on U.S. consumers. Americans going to the gas pump are paying more, and those resources are flowing billions of dollars into the Russian side. And effectively funding their side of the conflict. So Americans are essentially funding both sides of this conflict, and our leaders seem to be incapable of grasping that.
thank you for that. Uh, we're going to continue the constructive uh, uh, discourse uh, as far as uh, the uh, conflict uh, is concerned. Uh, understanding uh, all what you've said, uh, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what, in your own uh, perspective, what do you think are the uh, right measures to be taken that will actually uh, uh, mitigate uh, potential escalations and tensions between uh, Russia, the West, resulting from uh, this uh, increased uh, support for Ukraine? Because uh, you can attest uh, that uh, uh, this support is actually uh, uh, actually impeding the relationship uh, in every aspect uh, that the Russian Federation actually uh, shares with uh, Western nations. You know, I think there's a great affinity personally between, you know, and if people got to know each other better, between Russians and Americans. I think many of our leaders, both in the intelligence community and the State Department and, and in in Congress and, and in government, have this old Soviet era perspective of Russia. Uh, they don't know Russia. They don't know Russians. And I've talked with uh, friends here in the United States for a while that one of the challenges I think facing every nation is that most of those that are in charge of our State Departments and in terms of our of our military and our uh, intelligence agencies, many of them come from an academic understanding of other countries, not a personal understanding. They don't know the culture. They don't know the people. They haven't spent time in those countries. And, and that makes it very difficult when you're trying to make geopolitical decisions based upon what academics taught you in college who don't have any real world experience with the places we're dealing with. And I think that is certainly true uh, in U.S observations of Russia. And, and it's also true, I think, in terms of how Russia views the U.S. Too many academics are pulling the levers of power and not enough people who actually have been there know that. So if I was going to chart a course moving forward to try and resolve this, I'd start with some truth. There, there need to be more uh, journalists from, from the West who are actually reporting what's happening in these war zone areas, what's happening in Russia economically, that the, the, the Sanctions are not crippling Russia, as we've been told they would do. Uh, there needs to be more truth in the media reporting what's actually going on. Those of us who traveled to Ukraine for the recent votes have been attacked as uh, sham observers that this election was rigged. But I didn't see anybody from Western media there actually reporting things. And yet in 2014, when they were having the first elections in Crimea, you had PBS, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, others that were reporting live there from that vote. What's the difference then and now? Why, why are we attacked for reporting the truth when just a few short years ago they were there doing live reports? Second, in addition to truth, I'd say get back to the peace tables. Have some actual constructive talks about how do you resolve a conflict rather than just this sort of mindset of endless war and blank checks. And, and third, have leaders that are actually looking at what's the end game. And I think some in the US uh, Congress are asking that question now, what's the end game? You know, writing endless checks isn't gonna be the answer. There is be an end. Let's talk about how to get to that end and get past it. We are looking at how the support uh, from the US and NATO countries is actually uh, uh, helping to escalate uh, the crisis in uh, Ukraine. So now let's look at the role you just mentioned, uh, uh, the, the media. Let's look at uh, the role of uh, the uh, Western media in foiling uh, the crisis as well, uh, given uh, that you just mentioned uh, that you visited uh, the uh, uh, liberated uh, regions of uh, uh, Ukraine uh, recently. But then uh, uh, the uh, report that emerged after this visit uh, from the Western media became so problematic. So what is your perspective regarding the role of the media in helping to solve uh, the Ukrainian crisis? I, I think the media has acted atrociously. Uh, they've been absent without leave, AWOL, from this entire conflict. They haven't told the truth from the beginning. Uh, and again, there are always two sides to the story. Uh, and when you're only getting one side, uh, everybody should be skeptical about any reporting in any country that is only one-sided. Uh, again, you have the, uh, uh, the U.S. media that has, has taken a completely one-sided track on this. They, they won't even uh, seek out the truth. And I think that makes it hard for our policymakers to, uh, to deal with a situation where propaganda is driving the, uh, the issue rather than, than truth and, and realism. Uh, again, you know, those of us who traveled to, to see for ourselves what was going on 
have been called propagandist and Russian agents and all sorts of things. Uh, I wasn't getting that same pushback when I was embedding with U.S. troops in, in Iraq or, or in Kuwait. I wasn't getting that same pushback when I visited Guantanamo Bay as, as a guest of the U.S. government to report honestly on, on the conditions at those terrorist detention centers. But it's only when you conflict with the, uh, the, uh, the government view or the political view that the media has, uh, has embraced that you get uh, called for, uh, for, quote, not telling the truth when, uh, again, I didn't see anybody else over there reporting. More problematic uh, as to what a uh, role uh, the media has in, in as far as ending uh, the conflict is concerned. Uh, in light, uh, in light of potential uh, geopolitical uh, ramifications uh, coming to you, uh, dear Yulia, what role do you think? Uh, what role should <coughs> other regional powers? Uh, let's talk about uh, Germany. Let's talk about Turkey. Uh, what role should they play? in uh, supporting Ukraine and finding uh, a peaceful resolution to uh, the uh, conflict. What uh, practical support do you need uh, that these countries need at the moment that will lead to this end that we are talking about, a, a, a fruitful end? Well, at the moment, um, what is important to understand, you know, this uh, conflict has just uh, triggered many, uh, uh, many other related areas. And one of the key conclusions from conflict would definitely be a change of the balance of powers, right? Because the conflict itself, uh, well, on the one hand, any war, and especially a large-scale war, and we saw it happening during the World War II and uh, World War One as well. It helps to reset uh, the global system, the global geopolitical system, the global economic system. It helps to write off, you know, some of the debt and to change the balance of powers. So uh, the happenings right now. And here I should say that, uh, you know, there are there are several battlefields or potential battlefields of the very same war, uh, the war for, you know, the change of the uh, global balance of power. So that is uh, one of them, Donbass, one of them is Africa, and uh, all those events are related. And it can be no other way in the current, uh, you know, interconnected world. So another potential conflict area is definitely there around China and Taiwan, and we don't know if, uh, you know, some sparkle would ignite a big fire that side, and there are many other areas that, uh, you know, could be ignited quite soon as well. So as an outcome, we will see a changing uh, balance of powers, and that's just a natural cycle of how, you know, history develops and uh, countries and everything else. So. It's not something given once and forever. So the countries right now, I think many countries are just watching the fight uh, and, you know, supporting the winner, whoever the winner would be. So that's the position taken by many countries. And it's quite logical because you do not engage into a fight unless you think that it's your fight as well, right? So it makes perfect sense. And many countries are trying to, uh, you know, just make sure that they pursue their own interests. And again, you know, that is very much logical. But many countries, given the fact that there are so many lies and so many, uh, you know, bubbles uh, around this conflict, uh, they choose to stick to their own strategic interests and they choose to, um, you know, make sure that they're on the safe side. But I am absolutely sure that um, as an outcome of this conflict, regardless what, uh, you know, happens, that would be a global uh, transformation, and that global transformation would imply probably a new um, economic and financial system coming in, a new balance of powers, because we see the so-called raising powers, uh, you know, in Africa, China, Brazil, and many others that are supposed to be playing a different role at the global arena just due to their economy and human resources and overall potential and everything else. I mean, those are natural cycles of history. So uh, that's, that's important to understand that the world will not be the same after. And that's one of the uh, reasons why, you know, some time ago after the special military operation started, 
I founded the Globus Expert Club, and this is a venue where we talk about this kind of things post-transformation, but obviously no one would be able to give you clear answers at the moment, yet observing the trends and trying to make predictions, forecasts, and trying to make, uh, you know, come up with um, an expert vision and evaluation of, uh, you know, what is the desirable uh, image of the future and what could be done to make the, uh, you know, different kinds of systems function better. Uh, it is very important, but, you know, I see it all very much connected. The happenings in Africa right now, the happenings around China, the happenings in Donbass and, you know, many other locations where, um, you know, there, there could be some, uh, you know, ignition point in the upcoming future. You, uh, you you talked about uh, people engaging uh, for their own uh, personal interests or countries engaging in uh, the uh, conflict for their own uh, personal interests. And of course, uh, this uh, uh, is a human uh, uh, interest uh, question. Uh, want to understand, should people continue to put their uh, geopolitical or political interest at the expense of uh, the local population, because when you look at it critically, uh, the, the innocent people uh, have lost their lives uh, as far as the Ukrainian crisis is uh, concerned. So should people continue to put political interests first at the expense of uh, the population? Well, you see, that's uh, that's exactly something that re reflects the difference of the approaches being used in Donbass area. So if you look at, you know, simple facts, and there were many of them presented in the public space also, it was being discussed at the uh, UN, UN Security Council, and many other venues. The civilian population of Donbass was being shelled for many years. There were quite a lot of... Uh, public, um, you know, speeches and announcements made, made by the Kiev regime leaders that were saying that, you know, right, fine, our children will be um, going to school here and children in Donbass will be sitting down in basements and, you know, all, all of the uh, crazy things of the kind were being pronounced. When you see at the, uh, when you look at the uh, happenings in uh, Mariupol last year and the way uh, the uh, population of the city uh, it wasn't just that evacuated, but, you know, many of the people there were used as human shields by the uh, Azov, Bat Azov Battalion, um, you know, uh, soldiers and officers and the ones giving them orders. And that was shocking even for the irregular Ukrainian army because, you know, it's just uh, unprecedented. And um, when you look at what was happening in Mariupol, it was worse than Dresden in World War II because in Dresden, the, uh, the threat and the shelling was just coming from the, uh, you know, from the air. While in Mariupol, you could uh, you could meet your death any given moment, and the ones who were theoretically supposed to be protecting you were not the ones actually doing it. So when you compare the differences in the approaches, you see, um, you know, just looking at the simple facts, you see who's trying to preserve the human beings and the civil population and who doesn't care about it at all. So uh, given the fact that the Russian military potential is lar larger than the Ukrainian one, um, even given the uh, foreign aid uh, coming in, it does make sense to get down to the uh, peace talks, right? And it does make sense to get to the negotiation table. And that kind of opportunities were present last year while you know the ukrainian side chose to uh, make it illegal and cancel out this opportunity for themselves which is absolutely absurd when when you try to evaluate it from the point of view of simple logic so i mean in any in any given situation when you have a lot of complications a lot of uh, different things being said in the media and everything else uh, you can just take it down to, you know, simple facts and, you know, very simple logic. If something is way too sophisticated, it's highly likely to be lies, you know, not to not to say some other word that would be um, unacceptable for, <laughs> you know, the white audience. So um, it has to be simple. When something is simple and logical, it makes sense. When something is way too sophisticated, 
uh, you know, it probably means that uh, the truth is being covered by, you know, beautiful or ugly lies. While talking, you mentioned uh, uh, the Donbass, and of course, uh, I'll be inviting uh, you and Steve uh, together with uh, the uh, audience to watch this uh, teaser film uh, that introduces a documentary which brings uh, a greater insight on uh, the uh, crisis in Donbass. Uh, that, of course, uh, uh, there is a lot of complexity as far as it is concerned. So let's uh, watch this uh, teaser, and we'll get more uh, insight from you regarding the real situation in the Donbass. The conflict in the Donbass has always remained very complex and of course uh, difficult for some people to understand. We want to get a broader understanding of the conflict in the Donbass, looking at the origins, and of course, uh, we look also at the 21st century states surrounding the conflict in the Donbass, and of course, the changes that have occurred so, so far. The realities uh, of uh, the conflict in uh, Donbass, uh, uh, just uh, uh, in, uh, in your own uh, perspective, uh, Steve Hill, what do you think are the realities of the conflict in the Donbass, uh, the origin, because when you look at uh, so many people outside are still not aware of uh, the uh, origin of uh, this conflict and of course uh, the uh, uh, 21st uh, century stakes surrounding the conflict in the Donbass. Yeah, unfortunately, I think most in the West, uh, certainly in America, don't understand that this conflict for, for the people in Donbass and Donetsk and in Luhansk and uh, Mariupol has been going on for, for, you know, almost a decade as they've been under shelling, they've been under fire, uh, and yet the media has not covered that much in the past. They only started covering it only from one side when this uh, special military operation started. And, and I think you have to go back, uh, whether it's in, in this conflict or the other potential conflicts or other conflicts around the world. So much of this is a result of either after World War I or World War II, the academics that I was talking about earlier drew country lines that bore no relation to the people who lived there, their allegiances, their cultural identity. Uh, and that's certainly true here, where, where the people in the Donbass region identify as Russian, not Ukrainian. They speak Russian for the most part, not Ukrainian. And they're being denied the self-determination of deciding to be what they are. And you see this in, in other regions of the world, in the Middle East, where again, country lines were drawn by academics that bore no relation to who lived there, what allegiances and alliances and family traditions they had together. Uh, you can even look into Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland and, and Ireland, the conflict that, that raged there for so long. It, it was always portrayed by the media in the most simplistic terms that it's you know Catholic versus Protestant. There were cultural differences. There were economic differences. There was more to the story than just uh, you know religious dispute. And I think, again, we can look at, at Africa, and Clarice, you can certainly speak better to it than I can, uh, but so much of the country lines that are drawn in Africa were drawn post-World War I or World War II by the, uh, by the folks that had no real interest in what, what tribe was here, what tribe was there, who, who was affiliated with who. And these lines end up being battle lines when they're not drawn by the people who have a, have a living environment in that area uh, who are experiencing it, uh, when they're not the ones picking what side they're on, you end up with conflicts. Uh, uh, coming to you, uh, dear Yulia, uh, before uh, visiting, of course, uh, the uh, uh, liberated regions, uh, actually we are used to uh, hearing about the occupied regions of Ukraine. So today, uh, we want to take this opportunity to have you clarify uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, as far as uh, the liberated regions and occupied regions are uh, concerned, uh, given, uh, of course, uh, the uh, uh, reactions uh, that we had uh, from uh, Western media regarding the uh, just ended uh, regional elections uh, held in the liberated uh, regions of Donetsk, Luhan, Kherson, and Zaporizhia in uh, September 2023. 
Well, you seem to answer this question in terms of, uh, you know, if the regions over there are liberated or occupied, it's all about consent. It's all about the will of the people there, right? Because people are supposed to be the source of, you know, power and governance and everything else. And according to the UN principles, it's the people that actually have the power and delegate it to the ones they either elect or you know uh the ones that govern them so uh it's not me who's supposed to be answering this question but the people of donbass and if there are some doubts it in terms of the uh, referendum or other electoral procedures that were you know taking place there the best way to clarify the answer is just to go there and talk to the people and see what they say if there was consent and desire from their side uh to be a part of russia or not right so it's just all about this and it's the people of that land that are supposed to say um if they were liberated or occupied but uh you know there are the, as you mentioned and as steve was elaborating on there are not too many journalists uh from the West, uh, trying to go there and see with their own eyes and report directly, you know, from the ground. And there are not too many people in the Western media uh, disseminating the information that their colleagues received, because there are there are some um, uh, journalists from, you know, France and the United States and the UK and many other countries that even live in Donbass or spend a lot of time there um ever since uh, you know the escalation began or even earlier from 2014 so um i don't understand that for uh, you know uh, the uh, people watching us right now and uh, many people in africa or the ones you know living somewhere else maybe those issues of donbass seem to be not somewhere at the top of the agenda but you know the outcomes of the conflict will affect the uh, you know the global balance of power and if people in, in donbass manage to protect their right to make their own decisions and delegate the power to the ones they choose to i think that will also lead to major transformations in africa where people have the very same problem that Steve was just elaborating on, that, you know, it wasn't them making the decisions on the borders, it wasn't them making the decisions on how they're governed and everything else. And I think the rise of pan-Africanism and the uh, rise of this anti-colonial movement uh, will be even more, you know, active and it would reach uh, even higher levels uh, if the people in Donbass succeed. And... Um, Many people out there do realize, you know, this global uh, level of the uh, of the happening, and it's very important to understand that as well. That you know, those are different battlefields of the very same uh, the very same war, or you know, it's just the avant garde of uh, the very same movement for you know liberation, basically. So um, yes, I mean uh, uh, the, the the key point is to go and look, and documentaries like the one uh, you have just announced would probably help to show the opinions of the people who have been there, opinions of the people who uh, who live there, and that is key, you know, not uh, how it's presented in media and not what experts uh, say. But, uh, you know, having those firsthand um, opinions is uh, absolutely essential uh, when you talk about this kind of thing. So, uh, well, you know, from the, um, let's say, side uh, facts, uh, you can also make uh, or draw some conclusions or make certain, you know, a certain guess. Like uh, a lot of people were saying that referendum in Crimea in 2014 was a sham and people didn't want to join the Russian Federation. Okay, fine, but ever since then, have you ever seen any, uh, you know, major protests or, you know, people coming out and saying, no, we don't want to be a part of Russia? If that was the case, I mean, if uh, people were unhappy and dissatisfied with, uh, you know, with those facts, you would probably see some reflections of it uh, at least somewhere. But uh, it's not really visible, and you know, Crimea is uh, a region that is uh, getting integrated back, 
into Russia. And, you know, if someone has doubts, uh, there's always a chance just to come and go and see and talk to people, you know, anywhere, like in the street and in restaurants, cafes. So, uh, you know, it's uh, the path is open. Just one minute uh, with you, uh, Steve. Uh, after uh, listening to all your analysis, we are almost uh, uh, done with the program, but just one minute. Can you say uh, the role of uh, the uh, international uh, actors and organizations, particularly the United Nations, uh, the uh, European Union, and of course, uh, uh, the uh, implications uh, that this uh, support for Ukraine will have on uh, uh, multilateral cooperation? I think just briefly, they need to get to where the action is. And, and like Yulia said, listen to and talk to the people in Crimea, in Donbass. Uh, there was one lady that I talked to who pointed out, it was in one of the smaller villages that we were in, that said that there was a bridge in her town that was not repaired during the Soviet era, was not repaired during the Ukrainian era, but the Chinese have come in and under Russia rebuilt that bridge that had been un unusable for 40 years. The people are experiencing a difference, and that's why they're voting like they are. Thank you, who joined us from the United States in his capacity as a political commentator. It was a pleasure having you on Africa Media TV and hope to have you subsequently. Also saying thank you to you, uh, dear Yulia, for honoring this invitation and for your insight uh, on a topic for the discussion this year. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for always trusting the Pan-African television. I will now draw the curtains into this edition of the program views and the continent, but don't go away. I'll give, keep having a lovely moment in the company of our transmissions there. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous.